the city that never sleeps. 17 miles from Madison Square Garden, New York City. It's America at Night with Rich Valdez, America's favorite late night talk program featuring interesting guests from around the world and calls from across America. And now, here is your host, Rich Valdez. Hi there, good evening, and what's up, America? I am Rich Valdez, Valdez with an S, at Rich Valdez on all of the social media. Welcome to the Thursday night edition of the program. If you want to join our late night national town hall conversation, give us a call, 833-482-5337, 833-4VALDEZ. Of course, like usual, there's a bunch of things to to report on, and we're going to have some discussion around a lot of those uh, reports, these headlines that I'm looking at. Uh, let's see. There are now 12 jurors who are going to decide the fate of Donaldus Magnus, El Trompito, the 45th president of these United States. And uh, we'll get into that a little bit later, uh, only because I feel like it doesn't matter who you pick, right? Uh, ultimately, these people are not going to uh, really give a, a, a fair chance, right? They're not going to give them a fair trial. And now I could be wrong, pleasantly surprised, and I would love that. If I am wrong, super. If there's a hung jury, even better. But we will see what happens. Uh, I think only time will tell on that front. Now, we've got Biden. He's weighing a national climate emergency. Of all the things that are going on in America, uh, a national climate emergency is the most important. Now, of course, this is an old Democrat trick where Democrats will, you know, try to divert things, smoke and mirrors, sleight of hand, where they, um, you know, want you to think, oh, my God, the polar ice caps, the, the, the polar bears are dying because of you, because of me, because of, uh, you know, all of the, the big bad Republicans. Uh, forget about John Kerry's private jets and all of the electric cars and the cobalt and the um, fossil fuel it takes to drill for that cobalt and lithium. No, that doesn't count. So um, that's where he goes, climate emergency. Maybe we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, let's see. The um, There were some airstrikes reported in Iran, Syria, and Iraq. Um, we'll get into that as soon as we confirm those reports. And uh, I haven't really um, been up to speed on that. Let's see, 18-year-old trans student charged with planning two Maryland school shootings. Ay, bendito. Horrible. That's a good open phone topic right there. And lots of things to discuss. One of the things I want to get into tonight, uh, just because I want to talk about the budget in a little bit, and Speaker Johnson, and of course everybody's like, you know, beating me up on uh, social media saying, ah, you see, I told you he was a rhino. I don't believe that Speaker Johnson is a rhino per se. I believe that he's Speaker of the House, and that means he has to work with rhinos. He's got to work with Democrats. He's got to work with everybody. Now, I believe that. Now, there are some people that think you just railroad everybody and you don't work with anybody. And you just hold out until they work with you. Now, this is a tactic that may work for some. Um, I, I just don't think it's one that I would uh, espouse. I don't think so. I don't think there's enough um, will for it. I think most of the, the folks on the Republican side don't support this idea. I heard Congressman Greg Stubbe yesterday saying, you know, he hopes that um, Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene will um, reconsider. Uh, I heard um, Congresswoman Beth Van Dyne on this program say that um, she hopes that her colleagues will also um, be thoughtful and, and keep the people's business top of mind. So clearly th there has to be a time where our political will uh, is subdued by the will of the people, right, the, the people's business. And, of course, you could have conflict there and say, well, you know what? The people want me to shut down this government. I believe that that could be uh, a thing. I'm, I'm not against that in any way. The problem is I feel that every battle we get into becomes a shutdown. We're ousting the speaker. And it, it just, to me, is it's not, it's not working. I don't think it's working. I don't think we're achieving anything major uh, that we, we weren't otherwise achieving other than losing momentum where I think Trump's out there gaining momentum for Republicans, people saying, you know what, I'm going to vote Republican. And, and then you have the Republicans trying to make a principled stand, but five minutes before an election, it may not be the one. Now, listen, I could be wrong. You know, there's probably a lot of people out there saying, you know, Rich, you're, you're a spineless rhino. Have a spine. Stand up to, to the people in your party. Stand up to the rhinos. No more spending. I would love to. I would love to. I just don't know that th there's literally more of them than there are of us. So how, how do you make that happen but for cutting a really good deal? It's the only way I see it happening. 
but maybe I'm wrong. So we're going to talk with somebody who worked with Speaker Johnson on the budget. He was the um, the staff lead for the Congressional Budget Task Force, and he's coming up in a little bit. But I want to talk a little bit about immigration because there is a bunch of immigration stuff going on. And I saw a report, Fox News, where they're, um, things are just out of control. I mean, really, really out of control. Check out this report. Here they are warning the mayor and city council about transferring another $70 million from the city's rainy day fund to take care of the migrants. We need that money in my neighborhood. We need that on my block. So I'm asking y'all to use our tax money for our people. We need it. You vote for the money for these immigrants today, and we're coming for them seats. You can believe that. The police are fighting. I wanted to just jump in here and say that the the report is from Garrett Tenney from Fox News, and they're reporting on uh, Chicago Mayor Brandon Johnson's plan to to pay for more services for more illegal aliens and it's african americans that are up in arms in chicago that would just refuse to accept this from their mayor them in the, in the shelters that you guys are funding right. you guys think it's a great idea but yet your police officers are getting attacked right. your public's getting attacked Currently, state law does not allow voters to recall Chicago's mayor, but after seeing how Mayor Johnson's first year has gone with the migrants and crime, a new group wants to change that by getting a referendum on the ballot this November that would pave the way to voting Johnson out. We're not taking care of Chicago citizens first, and that's what it's all about. The fact of the matter is, is that we've never had this opportunity to recall before and it's very apparent based on the mayor's abilities right now or lack of uh, accountability that this needs to be addressed yeah mayor johnson is dismissing this recall effort is a right wing effort from folks living out in the suburbs but dan laughed at that saying he's lived in chicago for 33 years he is an independent and in the 24 hours since news came out about this effort he said there's been an outpouring support from folks of all backgrounds looking to sign on so again that is uh, the report from uh, garrett tenney uh, fox news on Chicago. But listen, it's no different in New York. In New York, we got a report uh, as well. Uh, I don't think we have time to jump into it now, but I'll definitely get into it around 1045, 1050-ish, as well as your calls, 833-482-5337, because it's super important, I think, for us to understand that this is a, a problem that is truly redefining the political landscape in some of the bluest cities in America. You've got black Democrats up in arms looking to oust their mayor in Chicago, likely in favor of a Republican one. You're going to see the same thing happen in New York City. Unless you find a Democrat that says things like, uh, we have to close the border, uh, we should uh, spend less, (laughs) you know, a a, a small government, um, let's kill the spending type of uh, conservative Democrat. I think that's who's going to end up winning. So speaking of spending. Let's see what happens in Congress, right? Because we um, we are up in arms. Many of us are up in arms about what's going on with the Ukraine funding, uh, funding for Israel, funding for this, funding for that. And and uh, you got a handful of people in Congress that are saying we're going to oust the speaker if he continues to play these games. And the speaker saying, look, I've got to do the governing here and he's going for it. And it's not a defense of the speaker. I'm just saying these are the facts. And we're going to get the scoop from somebody who used to work with Johnson, somebody who was the uh, task lead uh, uh, and the congressional budget team there. And um, I don't want you to miss it. So keep it locked right here, folks. 833-482-5337. If you want to join the show, give us about 25, 30 minutes and uh, we'll be taking your calls straight ahead. We're talking about the budget. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. By the way, your ratings are up. Congratulations. I had somebody. It's always nice to check. I like to see, even if they're friends, I like to see how are they doing? Are people listening, right? That's but right. But you're, you're doing great. America at Night with Rich Valdez. 
What we're going to allow is an amendment process at four separate bills that will be in one rule to be put on the floor, and everybody will be able to vote their, their own conscience in their own district. They can vote up or down on the Israel aid, the Ukraine aid, the Indo-Pacific, and then this uh, separate package that we have with other national security measures. Um, we've included a lot of innovations here. It's, it, it is different than the Senate's bill. For the Ukraine piece, for example, we've introduced the, uh, the loan concept, uh, the, the, the Repo Act, so the, any uh, funding that goes to support the government of Ukraine is converted to a loan. Uh, we, we introduced the Repo Act, which is the seizure, as you know, of corrupt Russian oligarchs' uh, assets. Uh, and, and that could be used to fund uh, the resistance in Ukraine as well. We have sanctions for Iran and, and Russia and China, the aggressors who are causing all this problem, the new axis of evil. Uh, we, we have a lot, of, um, a, a lot of new changes in here. We have accountability and a strategy shift as well. That is Speaker of the House Mike Johnson uh, seemingly taking a Solomon split the baby approach, saying, look, uh, this is going to be in the form of a loan. Uh, people can vote their conscience. You can vote up and down on it. But he's bringing it to a vote like uh, any good Speaker of the House would. And and I tend to believe he's putting his best foot forward. But somebody who knows this stuff better than me is Richard Stern. Uh, he's a former congressional staffer and the staff lead for the Budget and Spending Task Force of the Republican Study Committee. He's also the director of the Herman Center for the Federal Budget at the Heritage Foundation. Richard Stern, welcome back, sir. Thank you so much for having me on. You bet. So when you hear these comments from uh, Speaker Johnson, uh, what's your initial reaction to that? Well, I got to be honest, this is the kind of gimmickry that we, we've, know, we've come to know mm-hmm. and not love about Congress. So let me, let me break it down this way. So sure. this, the thing that they do in the House, and, and, and this is unfortunately the way of this, is, you know, she said, you vote on the rule, which is a procedural motion, and then that rule allows voting on four separate bills. So why is it four separate bills? Because the total aid package couldn't pass the House altogether. So what they're doing here is splitting up in the four different bills that are completely different from each other so that each bill can get a majority, but it's a different group of members. All these members of the House can say, I don't blame me. I didn't vote for the other three, the other two bills. I just voted for insert the blank here. This is a classic way of doing this where each member of Congress gets to home and go home and say, I didn't vote for the thing that's going to increase inflation. I didn't vote for the thing that's going to spend your money and give it to a cause mm. that shouldn't get your money. But somehow, magically, all of the bills passed the House. This is a gimmick that's been around as long as the House has. So do you think that this is going to garner any um, goodwill amongst already critical colleagues in the House like Marjorie Taylor Greene and uh, Thomas Massey and others that may call for the ouster of Speaker Johnson? So the two members you just named there, they are the two that actually call out this gimmick. Uh, Massey in particular has fought against this sort of thing for you know more than a decade, right? So. I, I, you know, I, I think some of his critics may be right. I mean, some of them actually are the ones that push to do this where it's four separate bills to give kind of cover I was just talking about. But, mm. you know, a lot of the critics that are coming out here, they're coming out both because of this procedural gimmick saying, why are we doing this? Why are we trying to pull one over, you know, fast one over on the American public? But a lot of the critics also are looking at this saying, this is a $95 billion aid package. It's $730 for every American household stolen from the American public, given to these foreign countries, or given, frankly, companies here that have corrupt ties to the government, and they're getting their money. And sure, you're not going to write a check for 730 bucks, but when mortgage rates go back above 8%, when grocery prices continue at the rampant pace, when when inflation comes back another month above 4%, that's why, because of reckless federal spending. So is the only remedy the one being proposed by Massey and uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene to oust every speaker that, you know, dares play uh, a game with with the budget or, you know, even engage in these types of gimmicks? No, so so I I think there's obviously a lot of different ways to solve this. And and the one that I would like to see is Congress needs to work together to respect the American public, to respect the Constitution. You know, this is a new thing in American politics. And, you know, I'm not going to say that our politics has been perfect, of course. But the truth is, for, for most of our history, Congress had, had a solemn appreciation for their role. They had an appreciation that every dollar the government spends is a dollar that they steal from the American public, as I said, through inflation taxes or through regular taxes. 
And so it's really been very recent that Congress as a whole just gets together and just recklessly spends this money driving the debt higher, driving inflation higher, driving Americans out of being able to afford a home or be able to put food on the table. So, you know, ousting the speaker or the last one, that doesn't change that dynamic. It doesn't get the rest of Congress together to wake up and do their job, to be respectful and responsible for the American public. Right. And this obviously is problematic in the area of, of virtue. Uh, you know, I always think back to what the founders talked about, about being virtuous. And it seems like po- Congress has become, you know, the exact opposite of virtuous. And this is why we're experiencing this. Everybody seems to be drunk at the, the trough of, of, of the almighty dollar, or I should say the, um, the, the printed dollar, right? Because it's not even that almighty. Yes, yes exactly. And, no, and it seems right. that they're just doing what they want to do. Absolutely. And, and really, part of what they're doing is the bidding of, of their donors, of, of the people that have corporate, you know, corrupt crony ties to the government. And, you know, I, I think to that point, by the way, you brought up the almighty or the formerly almighty dollar. You know, the Repo Act that, that he was talking about in that clip you had, right. that isn't, you know, quote, stealing from some Russian oligarchs. It's actually taking assets owned by the Russian government, to be clear, a country the U.S. is not at war with, they would take deposits from that government that are held by U.S. banking institutions and would steal those. Now, here's what's important about that. The way the banks work is they take in deposits and then they lend that money back out again to make investments principally in the United States. Of course. So if you go around to U.S. banks and you start stealing the deposits they're holding, regardless of who owns them, what it starts doing is making it hard for U.S. banks to guarantee that they have the assets to back up the loans they're putting out. This is something we have never done before. We have plenty of laws on the books to deal with terrorists, money laundering, you name it. We, the reason this would have to be a new law is this is an unprecedented step that undercuts our banking sector, the validity of the dollar, the validity of the dollar-denominated commercial system. We did not even do this to Nazi Germany or Imperial Japan during the Second World War. That is how unprecedented a step this is. And it won't be the Russians that feel this. They'll seize American assets in Russia. They'll cut off oil supplies to the rest of the global market. We will feel this through the collapse of the dollar internationally. Now, that's scary because we, we were t- talking about the collapse of the dollar through a uh, policy like this. Uh, just recently, we were looking at the uh, the collapse, if you will, of the Treasury uh, market uh, for a similar reason because of inflation and investments just not making sense anymore. And when you put all this together, it puts us in a what seems to be a financial Armageddon. Absolutely. We, we are on the precipice of that. And, you know, at the same time, by the way, the Russians started gold-backing the ruble. The ruble has been doing better than it has, not even recently, but for quite a bit of time prior to the war, prior to the embargoes. And you have Russia and China working together to talk about making a gold-backed BRICS currency, right, an I've international heard, let's, currency. Let's pause right there. I want to talk about BRICS, and I want to talk about a, a gold standard system in the United States, or maybe a return to one. Folks, we're on with Richard Stern from the Heritage Foundation. He is the um, director of the Herman Center for the Federal Budget at Heritage and former congressional staffer and staff lead for the Budget uh, Spending Task Force. So, folks, don't go anywhere. We're coming right back with Richard Stern and me, Rich Valdez. Mr. Call Screener who is a budding radio star, by the way. Richie Valdez is terrific. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. All right, Familia, welcome back. We continue our discussion tonight uh, about the budget, about the gimmickry, and a possible return to the gold standard, what that would look like, and this imminent uh, demise of the U.S. dollar if... uh, we don't wake up and do the right thing. Our guest, Richard Stern, director of the Herman Center for the Federal Budget at the Heritage Foundation. He was a staff lead for the Budget and Spending Task Force in Congress, and he's our guest. Richard Stern, uh, before the break, we left off 
with a you know a lot of bombshell statements, honestly, about the you know the kind of imminent uh, demise of the U.S. dollar. Uh, how other countries are using gold to support their currency, how we're not doing that. What's the likelihood of us returning to a gold standard? What are your thoughts? So, you know, truth be told, they already have a bunch of U.S. states that are actually in the works to try to produce a gold back or silver backed currency. Texas, Tennessee, for example, both have actually uh, bought gold, have reserves. And the Constitution, by the way, would actually protect the right of states to produce gold or silver backed currencies and they couldn't be regulated or taxed like, you know, a stock or a capital gains asset. They would have to be treated under U.S. law like a legitimate currency. Now, the chance that the U.S. dollar is going to get gold backed, I think is low. But if you think of it this way, right, the U.S. federal government is running almost a two trillion dollar deficit this year. The debt itself. So, you know, I give this stat that that keeps me up at night at the very least. Right. So. The construction cost of every single home in America is $33 trillion. Every single home you've ever seen, mansion, apartment building, single family home, to have built all of it today would cost $33 trillion. The debt is $34.5 trillion. Wow. So, you know, and in fact, 85% of dollars in circulation have been created just since 2008. So I think, you know, to your, to your point there, that's how close we are. That's how much we've obliterated the reliability of the dollar and the value of the dollar. So is, I guess, have we reached a point of diminishing returns? Is this the, the point of no turning back? Can it be salvaged? What are your thoughts? It definitely can be. What it would require is a Congress that is actually willing to, you know, reform taxes, to reform regulations, to do things that would grow the economy naturally, and frankly, to cut spending. So, you know, right now, and this this hundred billion dollar bill we're talking about here is yet another example of congr- of congressional irresponsibility attempting to spend money that we don't have that'll come at the expense of new inflation taxes on the American public. Congress has got to stop that. As long as Congress is willing to spend that kind of money to put a gun to the head of the American people, there's no way out of that. The only path to get back to this, to get lower interest rates, lower inflation, is to cut government spending. Do you think, given the current Congress that we have, that we'll be able to, to, to I guess, develop the political will to do such a thing? Maybe is it a president that's required to kind of help the speaker whip the votes, or is it just replacing uh, a bunch of uh, rhinos, for lack of a better word? Well, you know, I, I always believe in, in redemption. I think that there are a lot of people that can have a change of heart. But yes, I think it would take a strong leader. You know, I, I think this Congress has already seen some direction, change in that direction. We've had some leaders in Congress. I, You know, we've, we've seen conservatives in Congress derail some of the attempts to spend even more money. So, you know, I'm always an optimist, as, as much as we've been talking about some pretty gloomy stuff here. And I, I think there's a real chance of that. But, but you know, it's going to take more effort. It's going to take more time. It's going to take probably different members of Congress, at least in some places, and other ones that change their hearts. It's going to take a combination of all of that. Do you think ousting Speaker Johnson gets us closer to that goal or is more of a detriment? I, I, it's hard to say, but I, I, don't, I don't see it as necessarily being a good thing. And I, I, I'll tell you why. I think he is very much, and his staff are are kind of bottled into what they're doing in large part because of the conference. And so, you know, I, I think having an endless parade of speakers come in and out, that doesn't change the hearts and minds of the members of Congress. In fact, right. in some ways, it, it gives them an easy out. They can continue to be irresponsible, reckless, immoral in the way they wield their power in Congress and just simply blame the guy that they just got rid of. Right, exactly. That's exactly my thinking. Folks, we're on with Richard Stern, uh, director of the Herman Center for the Federal Budget at the Heritage Foundation and uh, former staff lead for Budget and Spending Task Force of the Republican Study Committee. Now, I want to get into uh, something you mentioned earlier about uh, the um, BRICS consortium and what they're doing uh, with gold-backed currency and potential um, different um, cryptocurrencies. Uh, But I'm going to take a pause right here and we'll do it on the other side of the break. Again, folks, Richard Stern, director of the Herman Center for the Federal Budget at the Heritage Foundation. We're coming right back. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5792. 
833-4 Valdez. That's Valdez with an S. Call now. 833-4 Valdez. That's 833-4. 482-5337. 833-4-VALDES. That's Valdez with an S. All right, folks, looking forward to speaking with you guys on this topic and everything else we're discussing straight ahead. Right now, we're going to wrap with Richard Stern. Richard, uh, thank you for being generous with your time. I really appreciate it. He's a uh, director of the Herman Center for the Federal Budget at the Heritage Foundation. And we were... Uh, talking about the budget, the gimmicks, um, the the gold standard being a gold-backed currency, and all of the issues that our country is facing financially. And one of the um, competitors or a group of competitors, a consortium of them, um, the BRICS nations are, in my opinion, trying constantly to come and eat our lunch. And I've had guests on this program that say it'll never happen. Others that say, watch out. It's, it's you know, whoa, whoa, here she comes. W- what are your thoughts? Well, it never happens until it does. That's the, what yeah. history teaches us about empires. So, you know, I, and I appreciate you delving into this topic. I think it's very important for people to understand. The U.S. dollar has all the advantages. You know, U.S. stock markets and bond markets are nearly half, half the value of those markets on the globe. And yet, the federal government, by running these deficits, by printing money with abandon, is obliterating the value of the dollar because of the regulations, because of all of these other things we're talking about. Frankly, because of our U.S. foreign policy, there's starting to be real concern about the dollar-denominated commercial system. So, you know, about 20 years ago, 70% of global commerce, actually more than 70%, was denominated in dollars, and that's now fallen to a little bit over half. Hmm. And so part of that is what we're talking about. And so, yeah, it's not going to happen tomorrow. But part of what the BRICS countries are talking about is creating a currency that's not tethered to any central government debt that no bank is printing an enormous amount of and making it redeemable or backed, in other words, by gold so that you really know what the value is going to be. And, you know, the value today is going to be the value tomorrow. And, you know, at the end of the day, the global economy go where down the path of, path of least resistance. They want to use a currency that preserves value, that allows for easy flow, global commercial flows. So as the dollar continues to be tethered to federal reckless deficits and the Fed manipulating the money supply wholesale, would people stay with the dollar? And so that is the risk that I believe we're staring down the barrel of. Now, this is... Um obviously a concern. Uh, I don't want to see any country or consortium of countries, especially uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, Saudi Arabia, and now these uh, African nations that have been joining the, the consortium. I don't want to see them come and, you know, eat our lunch. But it seems like there's a growing interest in the stability that comes with that idea, not necessarily dealing with those countries. What do you think the political aspect of this is, or I guess the political will to deal with these countries? Uh, or do they have agreement amongst themselves of what this currency would be? Uh, or does it belong to one specific country? Are they trying to develop a mutual currency? So I, they don't have a consensus right now. Don't get me wrong. These are all governments, right? All governments are, are beholden to this level of kind of disorganization. Mm. But, you know, part of it is, to your point, it's not just that they want to eat our lunch. It's that we are making their our own lunch available to them on a plate and mm. served and everything. Right. And that's really the problem here, is that we are inviting disaster with our spending policy, with our monetary policy. And, and there is simply no way to run the kind of deficits we're projecting. I mean... The federal debt right now is $260,000 per American household. It has truly become America's second mortgage. That is slated to be over $400,000 per American household at just the end of the decade. So, you know, how long can we go like that? How long can we push the world into this kind of monetary and fiscal oblivion before something breaks, before somebody comes up with alternative currency. And, you know, part of this is they weren't making a serious attempt at this because, and as you said, you've had guests on who said this, who would ditch the dollar? Just right. 10 years ago, I think that would have been unthinkable. Here we are today. 
And, and that's how quickly these things can change. Richard Stern, um, if you had a crystal ball, and I know you're a numbers guy and you don't, but um, how do you think this, this pans out in the next 24 to 48 months or even 12 to 24 months? Sh should we get a new president? How quickly do we right the ship? Uh, should we not get a new president? Uh, how quickly do we, I don't know, move <laughs> and start <Yeah>. spending a <laughs> different currency? And, and that's the $64,000 question, isn't it, right? So, yeah. you know, I, I think the important part of this, right, is that uh, whenever a new president's elected or whenever there's some change, markets usually respond immediately, right? Because the stock markets, for example, preserve the current idea, the current consensus of, you know, through infinite time, the value of what's happening. So if you get it, so I mean, you know, when Trump got elected the first time, the stock market jumped immediately. Yeah. That's because the consensus was we were going to have long term growth. And that is, we did until we had the pandemic. So, you know, I, I, my expectation if he wins, you probably will see some large increase in the market because there'll be an expectation of tax cuts and progress reform, of regulatory reform. If it doesn't win, of course, you get the opposite of that. You know, I, I do think the new wrinkle to this is even Trump has said he doesn't care about spending. He doesn't care about deficits. So, you know, I think part of this is markets are getting ever more cautious. You know, it used to be a, yeah, yeah, I know, you know, the U.S. will go bankrupt, you know, 20, 30, 40 years now, whatever. But the problem is it's gone from like, oh, yeah, well, maybe we'll go bankrupt at some point to, well, maybe 30, 20 years. The Social Security Trust Fund is expected to run out of assets in about eight years. That's how close we are. So, you know, as we get closer to that, if you continue to have leadership on both sides of the aisle who flat out say they don't care about spending, at some point here, you're going to have people saying, look, the music's about to stop and I want to make sure I've got a chair. And so that's, that's kind of the thing we're flirting with here. And that's at the moment seemingly true of kind of all of the politicians. Richard Stern, uh, director of the Herman Center for the Federal Budget at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, final question for you is do you think that we're do, do we ever reach a place where we get spending under control and actually tackle the deficit or do we just continue to maintain a deficit because we're the united states and we have a, a fiat currency that works for us so we just keep going i i think it's certainly possible that we we get a change in congress as we use you and i were talking about earlier I, you know we have seen a little bit of a change in congress so i'm i'm always optimistic that there could be a real moment here where people come together and say we can do this. We can sit down and make reasonable reforms. But, you know, I will tell you the other part of this. Um, so, first of all, it's impossible with a fiat currency to continue in perpetuity at the deficits are running. But even if Congress doesn't get together and does the right thing, just be told, you have Bitcoin, you have Ethereum, you now have, you know, Texas and right. other states putting together gold currencies. The truth is, there is, a, there is at least one backdoor way out of this which is to use stable pivots and alternative currencies. And, you know, the truth is, if the economy migrates over to those naturally, something that, frankly, Milton Friedman and, and uh, Friedrich Hayek both talked about as, you know, kind of gleefully, that is a way for people to save themselves, their earnings, their paycheck, their life savings from what the Fed is doing to the dollar. And so, you know, there might be a way here that even if we can't get a political consensus together to do the right thing, there may be a way here for, for really the vast majority of Americans to save themselves and, frankly, to force a change down the road that would get us back on track. Now, that's more painful than it has to be, but, you know, I don't like to rely on politicians to do the right thing, of course. <laughs> Richard Stern, thank you for being generous with your time. I appreciate it. You are a gentleman, a scholar, and a patriot. And uh, I thank you for staying up late with us tonight. Uh, and likewise, and it's always a pleasure being on. Thank you again. You bet. Godspeed. Folks, we're coming right back to the rest of your calls and questions and comments on this and immigration and everything else that we've been talking about tonight. Don't go anywhere. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-4. 5337 833 4 Valdez. That's Valdez with an S. I'm so glad to be. 
to be on your show, Rich. It's just an amazing broadcast that I hope the rest of America listens to every day. America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. All right, Familia, welcome back. Let's go to the phones, 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ. And let's go to Anthony calling us from Washington Heights, New York City, WFAS. Anthony, go right ahead. Yeah, hey, Rich. Boy, I feel like I hit the lottery yesterday. I just happened to be walking past that bodega uh, when President Trump arrived. How cool. Um, it, it, yeah, it was really interesting because right before that, about three van loads of guys from the Young Republican Club in Manhattan pulled in and they all stood around the bodega and cheered Trump and everything. They really did a nice job making it try to look spontaneous. I mean, it wasn't, they, you know, they was all staged and everything, but they really well, did a, a good job stop. making it look. I'm sorry? It's a scheduled campaign stop. Exactly. And there was yeah. really no one there. But but the, but when the van loads of the Young Republican Club showed up, it made it look like people were there and they were chanting his name and everything. Um, the whole thing was like a Potemkin appearance, um, but it was pretty cool. I mean, otherwise, nobody would have been there. What were you buying at the you bodega? Uh, just uh, some iced tea. Iced tea? What, fl- what flavor? Any like the, the peach iced tea, diet iced tea? What do you like? Yeah, pe- Snapple, peach Snapple, diet. You know what I love about the Snapples? They come with those little fun facts under the, under the, um, the lid. Yeah, it's awesome. But yeah. it was really Thanks cool. Thanks for your like call, I Anthony. I appreciate it. And something I wanted to get to before the uh, hour ends was this report from Savannah Hernandez on New York City. Being that we're on the topic of New York City and we have a little bit to go, let's see if we have enough time for one of those. Uh, maybe we don't. Uh, but it's it's regarding immigration. And as the caller uh, aptly pointed out, there Trump is um, on trial, right? He's on trial in New York City. And there's all sorts of mayhem going on in New York City. And part of what I think is important to, to look at is New York City Mayor Eric Adams, he literally just is not able to, to manage the influx of people that are coming in. So they've got a strategy that's been employed for years for homeless people. And that is to give them a one-way ticket out of town. Anywhere, Hawaii, you name it. They will get you out of town wherever you want to go. They'll get you the ticket and get you out of town. Now, like I said, we don't have time to get to this audio, but they're using this strategy in New York City now. And it's, um, it, it really is an interesting thing because when you have a, a, a city that's being overrun in terms of services, in terms of uh, capacity, what else can they do? Now, I think there's plenty that they can do. I think uh, Eric Adams can work very hard and make as many political deals as he needs to make with as many people as he needs to, right? How many people are on the city council uh, where he can say, all right, look, we're going to turn this thing around. But right now, the um, city ta- city council has him by the short ones. And I know that from having spoken with the... Uh, minority leader of the New York City Council, uh, as well as other council people. So what is one to do? He's got to be able to use politics to shift the opinion of uh, the council people to get them on board. Otherwise, I think they're going to run New York City into the ground. We'll get into that a little bit later. Folks, straight ahead, we continue our conversation. Big lawsuit against the airlines. Don't go anywhere. Adam Laxalt joins us. I'm Rich Valdez. The city that never sleeps. 17 miles from Madison Square Garden, New York City. It's America at night 
with Rich Valdez, America's favorite late night talk program featuring interesting guests from around the world and calls from across America. And now, here is your host, Rich Valdez. Hi there, good evening, and what's up, America? I am Rich Valdez, Valdez with an S, at Rich Valdez on all of the social media. Welcome to our number two of the program, our late-night national town hall conversation. If you want to join us, here's the number, 833-4825-337, 833-4-VALDEZ. And uh, there's a few things I want to talk about. Uh, Nancy Pelosi was on CNN yesterday um, opining about Prime Minister Netanyahu questioning whether he's capable of peace when, quite interestingly, he's not the aggressor here, right? He's retaliating. Listen to this. Do you think on the issue of Israel that where things stand right now between the United States and Israel, this relationship um, has been tense for for several weeks, maybe months now. Uh, Is it too late to repair that relationship between President Biden and Netanyahu? No, of course, it's never too late to repair a relationship, but uh, Netanyahu has to come around. He has not been a peace-oriented person. Do you think it's possible for him to be? I've always questioned that for decades now as to whether he could, was capable of peace, wanted to do peace, or was afraid of peace. Well, look at that. Now, it's funny because I think over the last decade, Every conflict that Israel was involved in wasn't something that they started. It's something that they finished. So when you talk about peace, to me, it seems like they're some of the most peaceful people out there. When was the last time you're walking down the street and somebody came yelling at you in Hebrew and blew themselves up or something like that, right? This doesn't happen. Uh, I'm being very, very facetious here, but that's the reality. Well, anyway, while Pelosi's trying to paint um, Netanyahu as the aggressor here, uh, he definitely did take action. And Israel has launched their retaliatory strike against Iran uh, for about the last 90 minutes. There has been um, missiles that are been, were launched. It's early Friday morning in Israel, and uh, they've, they're striking against Iran. And uh, we, there's a senior official that told ABC News what was going on. We'll, we'll have audio on that a little bit later. The uh, missile launches follow Iran's attack uh, on Israel on Saturday where they sent uh, more than 300 uncrewed drones and missiles towards targets throughout the country. Of course, uh, is the Israeli military uh, was able to prevent it, and um, good for them. Now, Iran's attack comes you know, nearly about six months after the original Hamas attack of October 7th, and that's what, what's going on here in Gaza, right? This is back and forth. Today, they're uh, bombing Iran as, um, uh, what's his name? The Maverick from Arizona. What was his name? Somebody help me here. John McCain. John McCain famously said, right, bomb, 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 bomb Iran. And that's what they're doing. Uh, They're uh, bombing Iran as we speak. So as there's more information available to that, I will give it to you. Uh, But that's the uh, the current update. Israel is uh, bombing Iran, sending uh, missiles. I'll keep you posted as we get more information on that. Now, I want to uh, shift gears a little bit because in addition to the budget and all these other things we're talking about, there is um, airlines and the big lawsuit with airlines. And this is of particular import to me because I I spend more time than I want to in an airplane. And I'm always thinking about different things. You know, is everybody okay? Uh, You know, meaning like, you know, are they high as a kite? Are they drunk? (laughs) That's what I'm thinking. The last flight I was on, I I came back uh, from Florida on Monday, Monday morning. And, man, probably one of the roughest um, descents into the New York area I'd ever been a part of, honestly. Everybody on that plane was throwing up. Everybody. It was, and they say it was turbulence. I think it was just a new pilot that was just shaky. But who knows? Maybe they lost a wheel. Maybe something else fell off. You never know what's going on, right? So there's a bunch of things going on, a bunch of lawsuits. And one of those lawsuits is being uh, brought by uh, Mountain States Legal Foundation, and, and this is an important one because it goes back about 10 years with uh, air traffic controllers. And I'm not going to do it justice if I explain it. So I want to bring in the former attorney general of Nevada, former candidate for the United States Senate and partner at Cooper and Kirk, Adam Laxalt. Welcome, sir. Thanks for having me, Rich. 
You bet, brother. Hope you've been doing well. It seems like yeah, great uh, to hear from you. Likewise, you're uh, keeping busy with this case. So you and Mountain States are uh, suing the FAA. Tell us why. Well, you know, it's, it's going to be shocking to your, your listeners, but back in 2014, you had a class of incoming air traffic controllers of about a 1,000 guys and gals uh, that were, you know, well on their way in. Uh, for, for your listeners' understanding, uh, those that go through the process these guys went through came through nearly 100% up to 2014. And all of a sudden, the Obama administration said that this class uh, was not diverse enough, and oh, they acted yeah. the entire class. And, uh, you know, these guys had already taken the collegiate program. They spent all their money. This is the same certified FAA class that air traffic controllers, incoming ones, have been going through for years and years. And they passed their exams, and they scratched the whole thing uh, because they said they want a, a more diverse uh, incoming class. And, you know, let me so tell you. Uh, everybody was white? Ahead, I'm just saying, is everybody what? white in this class? It was, the class was far too white, and there was there was not enough and minority representation. Wow. And uh, it's just you know it's it's you it can't it's not stunning to any of our listeners. This is this is who the Obama administration was, and of course the Biden, Biden administration pledged for whole of government uh, DEI essentially. And so, you know, we are trying to get these guys justice. We're trying to make them whole. Uh, the wheels of justice certainly don't don't move very fast. Uh, in our court systems, but they're certified. We are now toe to toe with the Department of Justice, and this class, this case is really heating up. But uh, you know, in light of everything that's going on in, in aviation right now, yeah. you know, you, you see the Boeing hearings, and you have to ask, you know, is Boeing DEI policies? Is that why doors right. are coming off planes? And you know, I'll, I'll, I will add that when you are flying and your flight is delayed now, your right. flight is very likely delayed because there are not enough air traffic controllers. And these mm. air traffic controllers, they're, they are so far below capacity, those that they have are doing overtime around the clock because they can't make up losing a class of 1,000 people. And you say, really? Well, there's only 14,000 air traffic controllers. So uh. when you lose an incoming class of 1,000, you can't make that up quickly. And so, you know, there was a, there was a big report uh, not too long ago where they claim that safety is not uh, ever going to be sacrificed. And, and first of all, we all watch the news, and you've had multiple near accidents that involve uh, air traffic control. But even if you took them at face value, what they say is that we will slow air travel down to make sure that these you know, we don't have near, near crashes or near incidents in air traffic control. And this explains, you know, for me, like you, I travel a lot. This explains why I haven't had an on-time flight <laughs> in the entire time that Pete Buttigieg has been, uh, <laughs> has been in charge. And so, um, you know, there, there's some serious questions that need to be asked of, of the Biden administration, of Secretary Buttigieg, uh, we got to get to the bottom of, is this still happening? You know, they're not denying that it's still happening because, you know, this is what they run on. This is what they believe in. But uh, these are serious concerns. The American public, first of all, I don't think any of us agree with discrimination in general. This is a leftist agenda that no one's voting for. But I'll tell you, the numbers have to go to 90% that are opposed to using DEI or discriminatory methods in areas that specifically involved public safety, like aviation travel. So this is a crazy deal. Uh, but, you know, the federal government, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're toe to toe with them and, and we're really hoping to get justice for, for this class of air traffic controllers. Folks, we're on with Adam Laxalt, former Nevada Attorney General and former candidate for the United States Senate. And Adam Laxalt, you're 100% right. I took a flight, um, let's see, on Friday, went to Florida, came back on Monday. And that flight to Florida was, I don't know, two and a half hours, whatever it was, three hours. And um, I was probably in the plane for closer to five because of the delay tr getting off the tarmac and the um, 
a, a exasperated pilot just kept coming on saying, sorry, we don't have the uh, flight path. Uh, and again, air traffic control problem. And he said, as soon as we have the, the flight path, we'll, we'll go ahead and, uh, you know, we'll get into the taxiway and we'll get out of here. And it took forever. And it's exactly what you're describing. And it's a sad thing. Well, there was a report that they asked New York to simply cancel a lot of flights because there just aren't enough air traffic control to handle the volume out of there. I mean, can the Biden administration destroy anything else? Um, and, and, you know, this is, this is what we jump up and down and say policy does matter. And, of course, yeah. between the media and all the Praetorian Guard that protects uh, Democrat administrations, does it get to average Americans? Uh, some, of course. Right. Um, but they, they know that there's a problem with aviation. They know it's less safe. Do they understand that there are policies that are directly connected to the issues that we're all facing when we're flying these days? Adam Laxalt, stick with me. We're coming right back. We're going to take a pause right here. Folks, uh, if you have a question for Adam about this case, 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Well, thank you, Rich, and thank you for everything. I know you very well, and I have I listen, but I have a lot of people that listen, and they love your show, and I appreciate it very much. America at Night with Rich Valdez. All right, familia, welcome back. Amigos, we're having a conversation with Adam Laxalt, former um, state attorney general for the uh, state of Nevada, and he's um, suing the Federal Aviation Administration uh, because of something that they did way back in 2014 where they canceled uh, close to a thousand air traffic controllers because they weren't diverse enough. They didn't meet the DEI standards of the uh, then Obama administration and now current Biden administration. And uh, what, what's interesting here, Adam Laxalt, is, you know, you were talking about how, you know, DEI is crushing this stuff. And, and I agree, it's, it's destroying so much. But at what point do the airlines come into the picture and say, hey, look, by the way, we're losing a bunch of money. Uh, we, you know, flights aren't taken off. We're having less flights taken off. People are upset. Less people are flying on my airline because they don't like us anymore. And uh, we're going to have to nix this DEI stuff. Corporate America is scared to death. And first of all, I should take a step back. Most of these major airlines are subscribers of this stuff. Mm -hmm. They've got, you know, left of center boards. Uh, this is what you get with, you know, the Fortune 500 and, 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 and above. And uh, it's, they're all infected with this stuff. And, but if you did have one <laughs> it wasn't, they'd be worried that uh, there'd be retaliation. And, you know, they'd, they'd, they'd be right to be worried. And so, you know, I don't, I don't know how we get out of this. Uh, I also have noticed that customer service at these airlines are no good. So <laughs> you can't complain anymore. Uh, you, you could choose to take your business elsewhere. But this problem has got to be affecting all of them. And just think of these, sure. these guys. And gals, they, they do it the right way. They're going to do a, a – they're, they're, they go to school and, and practice for a trade that's going to be a great, safe job, pension, you know, the works. They pay for school. They do it right. They graduate. And then they're just axed because they don't fit the profile of a Democrat administration. It is just appalling what these guys have been through. And, you know, look, some of them – made their way back into a successful career. Some of them never made it back to anything like a job that would pay them no hundred to hundred fifty thousand dollars uh doing a you know highly specialized technical job like being an air traffic controller. And so, you know, it's it's certainly a righteous cause um and you know all the pressure that's being put on from all corners on this DEI stuff, uh, I, I think conservatives you know, we get pretty down and we feel like, man, does, is, is any of this stuff moving the needle? One area that we've moved the needle a lot, mm -hmm. lot on is by putting the spotlight on DEI. Look what's happened to this NPR CEO in the last, uh, you know, few days, just pointing out how, you know, what a wokester she is. Uh, right. This stuff is having an impact. And so, you know, we just got to keep the pressure up. But, I mean, when, especially when it comes to safety, the American public is 1,000% with us. 
Adam Laxalt, this is a great point you're making that it, it, I think it's incumbent upon all of us in the conservative movement to make sure that when we have something that we're fighting that, uh, you know, for a traditional value, an American value, in my opinion, just the the idea of a meritocracy is to me a uniquely American idea. Uh, it's one of the truest essences of liberty that you could uh, have is just a meritocracy. Whoever's better at this is going to win. And when we when that becomes threatened and it's under fire because of somebody trying to socially engineer something by race or socioeconomic status or whatever they're trying to you know reverse engineer this thing for it it it's problematic to me i think because it takes away the strides that people of color uh, make on their own when they're competing in the same space as everybody else and when, you know, it's kind of like saying if you're going to have your own lane, we're going to do this for, you know, this is the Hispanic uh, air traffic controller class or the uh, African-American air traffic controller class or the white air traffic controller class. Uh, I think that it's it's the antithesis of where uh, this, you know, country was in the 1960s and, and we're going back to it. It's so backward to me. Yeah, and it's not, I always point this out. No one voted for this stuff. Right. No one wants this stuff. This is the left using the power of government when they hold the reins to jam it down our throat. And yes, over the last few decades, they've captured corporate boards. Uh, they've captured all the law schools, which is why, you know, all the, the, a lot of the judges and people involved in this whole system uh, are, are not upholding conservative values. And it is, it's, it's a dangerous path for us. Um, I, you know, I saw... I wish I could remember the airline, but one of the airlines insisted that they wanted 50% of their pilots to fit a certain profile. And right. you're like, Crazy. wait a minute. You mean <laughs> no one on the planet wants to make sure their pilot or their surgeon fits a profile. And these, they're coming. I'm, I'm from the U.S. Navy, which, you know, people don't know. There's a lot of pilots in the U.S. Navy and a lot of, a lot of them go on to be commercial pilots. Pipelines are pipelines, and are, are all these areas becoming gradually more diverse? Sure, but are they 50-50 right now? Absolutely not, and it would be catastrophic for aviation to impose these agendas on, on pilots and air traffic controllers and everything else in these systems. Yeah, I agree with you. It, it's fake. I mean, it, I think the best example of that is just when, you know, experiments I've seen where they ask people, you know, do people of color or women or whatever, you know, uh, DEI category you want to look at, do they want this job? And most of the time it's no. That's why they don't have that job. It's not that they're being kept from it. Those people just don't want it. All right. Most women don't want to be construction workers, I've learned. And that's why most construction workers happen to be men. And the ones that do want to be construction workers typically become them. Adam Laxalt, in the minute that we have remaining, I want to make sure uh, – People know how to find you online and on social and uh, learn more about the case and Mountain States. Tell us all about it. Yeah, I'm Adam Laxalt on all the, all the socials. And uh, Mountain States is an incredible, small, nonprofit legal operation that wakes up looking for righteous cases like this to, do, to try to defend uh, those that, that can't defend themselves. We're happy Amen Cooper to, Kirk to pair along with them. Adam, thank you for being with us. The music means they're kicking us out. Folks, we'll be right back. Adam Laxall, give him a follow. I'm Rich Valdez. Rich Valdez, who again will do a fine job, and I know you'll enjoy listening to him. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. All right, America, welcome back. Amigos, we continue our conversation. And part of what I want to talk about is how the Supreme Court is divided over um, the phraseology obstruct or impede an official proceeding. And that's the measure that they're using against 350 January 6th defendants. Um, it's interesting to see how the folks in uh, both the court system and the law enforcement establishment in Washington, D.C. have, um, I don't want to overuse the word weaponized the legal system, but it seems like it, it's been a very heavy handed approach to a lot of people that were not necessarily violent domestic extremists like they're being made out to be. And have been held for, for quite a, a long time. 
And uh, we've interviewed a, a couple of those people on this program to give you a sense of you know what that looks like. And J. Michael Waller is a former CIA operative in Central America. He's a senior analyst for strategy at the Center for Security Policy. And he's got a book. It's called Big Intel, How the CIA and FBI Went from Cold War Heroes to Deep State Villains. And uh, I want to get get into that because I think that's the reality of what we're seeing, right? We, we once uh, revered the FBI and lo and behold, the FBI and, and the Capitol Police and, and others uh, seem to be, you know, on the wrong side of, of history on, on this January 6th issue, uh, from my opinion. But let us um, welcome our guest, J. Michael Waller. Welcome to the program, sir. Hi, Rich. How are you, sir? Doing great. Good. I want to um, dig into this, and I, I, want, I guess we'll start there with the um, this uh, phraseology, uh, obstruct or impede an official proceeding. Um, how often do you see that being used in, in massive cases like this? And does it seem to you that they're just kind of grasping at straws just to be able to, to lock people up? Sure. You almost never see this. I don't think there's ever been a... a a case where you've had a crime for criminal destruction of documents uh, being used to get people who have protested either violently or nonviolently. Uh, it's just a big overstretch. If, if these people committed insurrection or sedition, we have insurrection laws and sedition laws, but no one has been tried for that yet. Yeah, and this is, a, I think it's a big deal uh, because we continue to see it happening in the, in the, in the courts, people continue to go through through this issue, and and I think the premise of your book really lends itself well to what I think we're seeing, which is how again these once great legacy organizations, whether it's an intelligence agency like the CIA or an investigative agency like the FBI, which has become a counterintelligence agency, have really become deep state villains. Tell us more about it. They have, and it really hurt to put that on the book uh, because they were, I had wanted to use, not wanted to use either of those terms, either villains or deep state. In the book, it was just supposed to look at what's happened to the FBI and the CIA under Obama and Trump and Biden. But then you go back and you keep pulling on the, the this, this string about well, who are the ideological drivers of this? How did they get their training? Who put them up to it? You, you trace it back a century. And it's really people who uh, uh, finally, over generations, uh, became radicalized through the law schools through our universities, and uh, the radicalized ones became third hires uh, after 9-11, when we had a huge hiring in the FBI and CIA and elsewhere in the, in the intelligence community, and at the same time, President George W. Bush centralized everything the way it never had been before to make it more efficient so we'd never suffer from a, another terrorist attack. But we centralized everything from the top. He allowed a revolutionary like Obama to come in and radicalize it from the top and then to pull the radical ones from the bottom up through the nervous system. And so they took over the organizations. And they never gave them back. Right. That's the no, sad part. It is the sad part. And then they, they have, they've taken missions now where the jihadist terrorists are, are, you know, essentially gone. They're still around. They're still a problem, but not the way they were. Uh, but you're not allowed to use the word jihadist or radical Islamic extremist or anything anymore. But be, they've gone in search now for new enemies, like any bureaucracy is going to go find a new mission once the one mission has been accomplished. And in this case, they're searching for new enemies. And the new enemies are uh, people who support small constitutional government and don't like the corruption in Washington. Folks, we're on with J. Michael Waller, former CIA operative in Central America and uh, senior analyst for strategy at the Center for Security Policy. And J. Michael Waller, um, we're going to take a quick pause here. When we come back, I want to get your take on how, you know, subversion is being used to... Um, you know, get inside the American psyche and uh, implement Marxism and, and other ideologies that are rather inconsistent with um, the liberty, I think, that the founders um, envisioned. So stick with me, folks. We're coming right back with J. Michael Waller, uh, author of the book Big Intel, How the CIA and FBI Went from Cold War Heroes to Deep State Villains. Don't go anywhere. This is America at Night. 
with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. There is more news in your commentary, in your analysis, than there is on the news network. America at Night with Rich Valdez. All right, amigos, we continue our conversation on the book, Big Intel, How the CIA and FBI Went from Cold War Heroes to Deep State Villains. And we were talking about how this um, idea of obstructing and impeding an official proceeding has been used against uh, 350 defendants in in the January 6th uh, uh, case that that has appeared before the courts. And this is what uh, the Supreme Court is currently divided over. And our guest, J. Michael Waller, former CIA operative um, stationed in Central America, and he's currently the senior analyst for strategy at the Center for Security Policy. And J. Michael Waller, um, in your book, uh, which is... um, uh, very well documented. You you trace the origins of big intel to a loose network of Marxist academic agitators known as the Frank uh, Frankfurt School. Um, tell us more about that. Yeah, the Frankfurt School was set up in Frankfurt, Germany. It was a, a Soviet inspiration. It was set up by the Bolsheviks in just over 100 years ago. Uh, they had a meeting in Moscow with the European Communist Party leaders, and they thought, we can't have a Bolshevik violent revolution in the West. The best way that we can get them to have their revolutions is to subvert them from within and to teach them over generations to subvert themselves so they don't even realize that they're doing it. It's just how they think. And so it was to attack everything from culture to the, the nuclear family to the idea of patriotism, the idea of Western freedoms, any of enlightenment values and going back to the Judeo-Christian traditions, everything had to be destroyed by constantly questioning it, ridiculing it, mocking it, undermining it in every way. Well, they thought they were going to take over Germany this way, but and Hitler beat them to it. So a large number of these academics and, and cultural figures came to the United States and they set up at Columbia University and, and elsewhere in the country and they began training generations of people in in diplomacy, foreign affairs, intelligence, law, journalism, uh, you name it. Uh, people who would later go on into our government, and they created something called critical theory. And critical theory is like critical race theory and DEI, we see it there. This all came out of that, what began as a state operation. The short of it is they infiltrated the... Um, Uh, U.S. intelligence when it was being set up during World War II, the Office of Strategic Services. And and there were also, there are a whole lot of communist agents, uh, Soviet agents, Communist Party members, and there were congressional injuries into this even at the time. J. Edgar Hoover was warning about this at the time. And their goal was not just to defeat the Nazis, but to win World War II on Stalin's terms, not on our own. Mm. After the war, we didn't have an intelligence service for a couple of years. Then the CIA was set up. Some of these people went into the CIA, many went into the State Department, and many more went into you, to the universities to teach our future prosecutors and judges and diplomats and spies. So this, this uh, developed over, over decades until finally by the 1990s, almost every law school in America was teaching critical law theory as opposed to American constitutional principles. And so we have what we have now. A huge problem. How do you see us fixing this problem, J. Michael Waller? <laughs> it's, a, it's a gigantic problem. Luckily, bureaucracies, first, there are a lot of uh, really good people in these organizations and other people who will just go along with whatever they're told to do. Uh, the really good people still, uh, they, have the, they have jobs they can't afford to lose their jobs, so they're going to go ahead with whatever they're told to do. Right now, they're being told to embrace DEI and to dispense with American founding principles as something that was cooked up by evil white men to, you know, maintain a racist, misogynistic society. So there, 
when people say we have to just get rid of the FBI, you know, we need something like the FBI and we need what it does. We need something like the CIA. We, you know, we, we've got a lot of enemies out there and a lot of terrible people here. What do you do about it? So with any organization that gets too powerful, uh, it should be broken up into smaller pieces, like an antitrust mm. case. Yeah. And in the FBI's case, you take counterintelligence to hunt the spies as one service and then uh, counterterrorism to go somewhere else and people are working on a kidnapping or you know child abduction cases in another service and so on you just break up the FBI into logical parts uh, and then and then get rid of the rest just terminate all those positions so that th- those federal employees are gone and then hand more power down to the states especially in states where the sheriffs are strong. Uh, they, they don't need armed federal agents running around the states when the state authorities can do it just fine. And if they need federal help, they can get it in an investigative sense or technology sense, but you don't need federal agents running around armed in American cities. And cities. That's one, one portion of it. On the CIA part, it's a bit different. It's just fat and bloated. You don't need to mm. spy on the climate. You don't need to spy on gender. Uh, right. You, you, see, you, know, you, don't, you don't need a lot of that. And so there, there's a lot of a huge amount of waste in the CIA. And, and we surprisingly, there's that many actual CIA agents in the, the clandestine service. People would be shocked to know how few there really are. It's mostly just become a bloated bureaucracy. Wow. That's disheartening because you're thinking these guys are, are the spies that are saving America. Right. <laughs> and uh, well, they're all that's out. not the case. Yeah, they get, they become a problem when you know, when they when they break the law, that's a problem. When our foreign intelligence agents interfere in our own political system, that's a problem. When our chief law enforcement agency routinely breaks the law, that's a terrible problem. Then we have a justice department inventing crazy laws to bust people because the present laws, you know, they want to put them in for 20 years on a, on a law designed for destruction of paper and electronic records when it has nothing to do with the alleged crimes they committed. So they, if they're not going to charge them with insurrection or, or other you know very serious crimes and they can only get them on trespassing, uh, you're seeing them now dig up laws and invent new applications for it, which affects everybody. So if you want to have Think, think of it, if a, if a union can't strike, I'm, I'm really not a big union guy, but you know they have a right to strike. Uh, if people can't have sit-ins or picket lines, they're going to be busted on these same charges. So this is just going to be fewer freedoms for everybody if this type of thing is held up. Right, yeah, negative all around. Uh, folks, we're on with J. Michael Waller, former CIA operative in Central America and senior analyst for strategy at the Center for Security Policy. And J. Michael Waller, um, I'm really enjoying the insight that you're giving us about your book as well. Uh, The book, again, Big Intel, How the CIA and FBI Went from Cold War Heroes to Deep State Villains. And it seems to be the case today as well. Uh, When we come back, I want to get a little bit of your background. Uh, I'm guessing that when you were a kid, um, you know, you must have had an epiphany at some point and said, oh, my gosh, when I grow up, I want to be a spy and I want to be stationed in Central America. So you're going to have a chance to tell us all about that when we return. Folks, we're coming right back with J. Michael Waller. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. Now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. All right, amigos, we come back with Michael J. Michael Waller, former CIA operative in Central America. And I was joking before uh, we took the pause and saying, you know, when you were a little kid, I'm pretty sure you said, I want to be a spy and I want to be a spy in Central America. How did you get involved and how did you end up stationed there? J. Michael Waller. <laughs> well, it was a weird beginning. It first started out, I didn't want anything like that. I wanted to be an environmentalist and uh, or at least have, have that as something to do. Because when I was a kid in the 1970s, 
uh, they were building a nuclear power plant in my home state, New Hampshire. And I got involved in the anti-nuclear movement because I was afraid that the, the water coming out of the cooling system of the reactor being dumped into the ocean would, would uh, harm the fish where I go fishing with my grandfather and my dad. So I got involved, uh, but then they started picking out certain kids for leaders, and they had professionals come in from California for this purpose. And I, I was taken aside and isolated. This was after a fashion of getting involved. Uh, and, it, you know, they trained us to commit acts of vandalism and to, you know, do all wow, sorts so of other Wow, so you became like a, rad, a radical environmentalist. Well, I, I, I was almost there because you get in and it's kind of like it's really – wrong to do, but of course, it's fun to do wrong things, especially when you're a teenager. And so, you know, training you to go up in a canoe through the salt marshes with bolt cutters and spray paint to spray paint slogans on the containment dome that they're building, you know, for the reactor. That was yeah. a pretty cool thing to do, or, or so I thought. But then they put me in what I later learned was a struggle session to, to have me criticize myself, and then they're criticizing me, and they say, why do you want to be involved? And I said, well, because I care about the environment. And they treated me like I was an idiot and said, this is all about overthrowing American capitalism. Oh, so they were honest. Yeah, but that was my epiphany right there. I said, Yeah, you were like, yeah, I, I want I, nothing I, to do with that. <laughs> no. So, so in, in my mind, I thought, yeah, I'm going to fight you guys for the rest of my life. So that's what I ended up doing. Because these organizers weren't just environmentalists. They'd been supporting the Viet Cong and the North right. Vietnamese the enemy before that, and Fidel Castro. And then later on, they were supporting the Soviet and their active measures campaigns, and then the jihadists, and, and now, now probably Hamas and, and Hezbollah. So, I mean, it's the same kinds of people. Uh, and then the, and then some of them uh, got money and went into politics and got elected to public office. So, so in the course of that, anyway, I ended up down in Central America um, working against the communists there uh, when President Reagan was in his first term. Wow. Quite a story. So um, you, you end up not becoming a radical environmentalist and you go in a different direction and you end up at the CIA and uh, Central America. Was that something they threw upon you because you were a Spanish major or was it something you selected or was it just happenstance? Well, it was a little bit from that. It was I was not a CIA employee at all, so I never was on their payroll. I never went, got their training in in an official sense. I went down there as a student journalist. I was still an undergrad. I was 21 years old, mm. and the Reagan administration at that time needed people to really people who didn't know what they were doing, who would do really dumb things again. There, there I was, happy to volunteer <laughs> and get so, a pension for that. Yeah, so I was I was going to go to Afghanistan with Soldier of Fortune magazine, with the um, with Ahmad Shah Massoud's Northern Alliance people were fighting the Soviet army, and then uh, but because I'd been an intern in the U.S. Senate and I get to meet a whole lot of people in Washington as a as a young person, I met the some White House people and they said, I told them what I wanted to do and they said hey. Um, wow. you speak Spanish. Why don't you go down to the continent in Nicaragua? So I did. And in the course of that though, I met CIA mm -hmm. director, Bill Casey, who, who gave me a name. And I thought that was the name of, I was somebody I was supposed to ask for. T I, it turned out 30 years later, I realized that was my code name. <laughs> That's cool. And I, and I ended up, uh, ended up down there in a private network that CIA director Casey was funding out of his pocket. To go around right, we'll, the we'll leave it the there because uh, I don't want you to get cut off by the music. J. Michael Waller, uh, former CIA operative uh, in Central America because he spoke Spanish, and senior analyst for the strategy at the Center for Security Policy. Get a copy of the book, um, Big Intel, how the CIA and FBI went from Cold War heroes to deep state villains. J. Michael Waller, you're a gentleman, a scholar, and a patriot. Thank you, sir. Okay. Good night. You bet. All right, folks, we're coming right back. Open Phone America. I'm Rich Valdez. Live from the city that never sleeps. 17 miles from Madison Square Garden, New York City. It's America at Night with Rich Valdez, America's favorite late night talk program featuring interesting guests from around the world and calls from across America. And now, here is your host, Rich Valdez.
Hi there, good evening, and what's up, America? I am Rich Valdez, Valdez with an S, at Rich Valdez on all of the social media. Welcome to Hour 3 of the program. We like to call it Open Phone America, where we take calls from listeners all across the country. If you're in California or Oregon, uh, give us a call. New York City, give us a call. West Coast, East Coast, everybody in between, 8 833-482-5337, 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ. And we've talked about a number of things. Um, we have had discussion on the gimmicks that are being used to um, continue to spend more money than we have in Washington. And this is why folks like Marjorie Taylor Greene and Thomas Massey in Congress are up in arms with Speaker Johnson because it's a, it's a cheap political trick that's been around for as long as Congress, according to our guest in the 10 o'clock hour, and people are upset. So we've uh, had that discussion. We um, continue to have a discussion on the FAA, which is being sued uh, by Mountain States Legal Foundation and our buddy Adam Laxalt. And uh, that was an interesting topic as well, I thought, because, you know, shoot, somebody's got to sue these guys. And uh, over DEI uh, abuses. And, of course, we talked about the the changing trend that we see where the FBI and the CIA were once great organizations and now have become political pawns for those that um, make up the leadership and uh, use the rank and file to kind of do their dirty work. And uh, those are strong statements and likely unfair for most people. Uh, and I realize that I don't want to paint with too broad of a of a brush, but that's definitely the case, and that's actually happening in um, more places than it should. So I'll stick with it for now. And of course, your calls. Excuse me, eight three three four eight two five three three seven eight three three four Valdez. And I want to um, okay, go back to the big story that broke uh, a little bit earlier, where Israel has now retaliated against Iran. Uh, launching missiles against Iran. We have a report. Listen to this. Two U.S. officials now confirm that an Israeli missile was launched into Iran. That strike follows Iran's unprecedented retaliatory drone and missile attack against Israel last weekend. Prime Minister of Israel Benjamin Netanyahu had vowed to respond. Several commercial flights are now being diverted away from western Iran. Iranian state TV reports a loud noise was heard near the Isfahan airport in the central part of the country. The airport also serves as a major airbase for the Iranian military. So far, Iran's government has made no immediate comment. So there you have the, um, the uh, report on that. Israel doing what they do, right? They, they said, hey, we'll come and get you. Uh, Iran saying, oh, you want more? Israel came, gave them a little more. And, and this is going to continue to go on until it gets uglier. And I'm sure that's exactly what's going to happen because we don't have an adult in the room per se. And I'm not um, taking a, a shot at Netanyahu, but I'm saying it's the American president that should be the adult in the room, the one that should say, all right, guys, that's enough. Take it easy. And it's not happening. There is no American leadership. Biden hasn't said anything. Um, whether it's, hey, cool it, let's have a conversation, or actually, you know, making moves. Either way, uh, Biden's having it uh, both ways, and both ways that he's having it are wrong, right, uh, in, in my opinion, uh, both adding danger to an already volatile region and just not supporting the, the existing uh, relationship that we have with Israel. So I want to get your thoughts on that uh, before we uh, take a break. Let's see. Uh, let's go to Tampa, Florida, listening online, richvaldez.com. Let's go to Edward. Go right ahead. Yeah, Rich, can you hear me? Sure. Yeah, I definitely support this attack. Uh, I know they hit a city where one of the military uh, nuclear plants is, uh, is Frehan. I think that's how you pronounce it. So hopefully this is going to be something that's going to continue because they really need to take out the nuke facility out. Uh, you got the Hezbollah in Lebanon and in the Houthis in uh, Yemen. They got to be dealt with too because they're interfering with shipping. So I, I definitely support this. The president is leading by behind as usual. So it's very unfortunate. Yeah, I agree with that. And it, it's uh, it's a tough situation for, for, for those guys. They have to keep fighting. They, this is a, a battle for their existence. And um, the Iranians 
I think, need to be checked. They need to be corrected. They're involved in way too much. Biden's allowed them to make money. Biden's allowing them to get involved. And uh, seemingly with, you know, to, to the tune of sanctions. And even some of the sanctions that we heard about earlier are really just theft, like the ones they're imposing on um, Russia. And this is something that ultimately will, will hurt us, according to our guest, Richard Stern. And, um, and I get the, uh, the angle that he was sharing with us. So it's, it's definitely um, not in our best interest for, for these conflicts to continue, in, in my opinion. Uh, for those who think that, you know, we're going to make a fortune on military contracts and stuff like that, I think we're going to make th- that money no matter what, right? You don't have to be in an active conflict to, to make that money from what I've seen over the years. But I appreciate it. Edward, uh, Tampa, Florida, listening to richvaldez.com. And folks, we are going to continue with your calls straight ahead. I want to give an update on what's going on in some of our biggest cities across America. Earlier, you heard a report on Fox News of a bunch of African-American voters showing up at their city council meeting and demanding that um, no more money be given to illegal immigrants and changing the actual um, mayor is something that they're considering. Uh, it's it's a fascinating, a fascinating thing to watch considering this is Chicago, right? It's a, it's a Democrat bastion. You never thought that you'd see something like that. So uh, we're going to get into that as well, plus uh, the rest of your thoughts. I see we have calls from Maryland, Alabama, Idaho, Oregon, and more. Make sure you um, dial in. If you're interested in having a conversation with us, 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. And he's breaking it down. It's America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. The 2024 election about two fundamentally different visions for America. Donald Trump's vision is one of anger, hate, revenge, and retribution. He embraces the insurrectionist of January the 6th. He's running on it. And as mentioned already, he promised to be a dictator on day one, his own words. And he called for, you know he means it. And he calls for another bloodbath when he loses again. The only bloodbath we're seeing is the bloodbath at the border with all of these illegal immigrants coming into this country doing what they want to do. The guy that has been accused of killing Lake and Riley, who uh, Biden acknowledged as an illegal, who uh, President Trump uh, has, has blasted, and you name it, everybody in America, I think, has said something about this guy. This guy was released from police custody because they said they've run out of room to house criminals. You tell me if we don't have a joke of a system going on right now absolute crazy town right you've got you've got the police in denver defunding the police by 8.4 million dollars so that they can divert those 8.4 million dollars to illegal immigrants who are staying in shelters and whatnot now you tell me if you're a person a citizen in in a resident uh, of denver and you're like man if one of these people comes we know they have a track record for crime Right. It's just the reality of things. So somebody comes to 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 harm you or your family and you call the police. Now you don't have police anymore or you have police with eight point four million dollars less in their budget. This is crazy what we're seeing here. And you also have advocates out of Denver that are now complaining, saying that six months of free rent is not sufficient. It's a slap in the face. Right. This is a housing advocacy group 
slamming uh, Denver's new asylum seekers program is insufficient. And it's a slap in the face, even staging a protest to voice their disapproval as the city spent tens of millions of dollars on illegal immigrant aid and slashing their emergency services budget to save, uh, excuse me, to stave off insolvency in the wake of this influx. This is an absolute sin. It's a disgrace what we're seeing. And Savannah Hernandez is a uh, uh, reporter that does a lot of uh, frontline news, and that's the name of her program. It's called Frontlines from Turning Point USA. And she was on the ground in New York City, and we've got two clips from her where you can see exactly what Joe Biden's talking about, these two Americas, right? These, uh, this view of America that is about the American dream, and then this view of America that is um, free, free, free. And listen to Savannah Hernandez. This whole entire area was filled with migrants back here. And as soon as we started filming, they're now moving them all inside because they don't want us to see what's going on in New York City. Now, I want to highlight these signs as well. They say, did you know we can book your ticket to travel anywhere outside New York City? No need to wait in line. Just tell the front door staff you'd like to get a travel ticket. Now, this is in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different languages up there. So you have multiple people from multiple countries. Um, being offered free tickets out of New York City. And again, this whole area was just filled with migrants. But as soon as we got here and we started trying to speak to them, uh, they're all gone now. Now, that's a report out of New York City where um, she's seeing what's going on. And, and oftentimes when you see a report like this, somebody that's grabbing some video and able to report on it, the, the, even the security guards that they've hired at these uh, facilities will tell you, look, we're, we're not supposed to let anybody see anything or tape any, take any videos or, or tape anything. This is, um, you know, you got to go. And every now and again, when they when somebody gets around that, we start to see how, how this is working and not not a good look. But uh, Savannah Hernandez was able to catch up with uh, someone that's living in New York and gave us uh, some insight into what it was like. Check this out. They give me a ticket for free to Chicago. I fly tomorrow. For free? For free, Why are you going to Chicago? I try to find any work because I'm homeless immigrant from Russian Federation. Yo, my name is Mark Miriam. You're from Russia? Yeah. Who gave you the ticket to go to Chicago? Chicago, no, this special government service company, you know, they try to help uh, new people, new immigrants who come. You're excited to go to Chicago? Yeah, because I want to see new city. It will be, uh, I want to feel new vibe, a uh, new atmosphere, and maybe try to find new contacts, new friends. So you, know. you were in New York for one year, yes. and now you're, you got a free ticket, with... and now you're going to go to Chicago. Da. Da. And then after Chicago, I go into Los Angeles because it was my first city in my life before New York. Did you get a free ticket to go to Los Angeles as well? Yes, yeah, if I ask them. But uh, at, this, at this moment, I, um, I have like a one friend in Chicago and it will be new ex- experience of, of, for me, you know. So you stayed in New York for a year, then you're going to go to Chicago yeah. and then you want to go to L.A. Yeah, yeah I try to get any work to Chicago uh, to collect, you know, and to fly to... Uh, but maybe something happens with me in Chicago. Maybe I find good work, good friends, and I will be living in Chicago. So I don't know about future. Listen, sounds like a nice enough guy. I just, I don't know if he hates America, if he hates me, if he hates our system. But right now it seems like he's there saying, look, I'm just looking for a job and trying to get by. Uh, hopefully he's not part of a undercover cell, a sleeper cell of, of you know, anti-American individuals. But this is what's going on. Left, right, and center, it's happening all over the place, right under people's noses. And nobody is the wiser except for the people that are living in New York that realize what's going on, the people living in Chicago that see this happening day in and day out, the people that are out on the West Coast that are experiencing this, uh, you know, in, in real time. And it, it's a shame. It's an absolute disgrace to see this happening. Um, and nobody seems to be stopping anything. Let's go to the phones. Alex, Brooklyn, New York, WFAS. Go right ahead. You're on with Rich Valdez. Before you get to your point, I want to ask you, uh, what do you think about what's going on in New York City with all of this illegal immigration? I think it's a disgrace. And, you know, now they're offering them tickets to leave, but they're offering even more incentives to keep to, for those migrants to want to stay in New York City 
So Mayor Adams is like, oh, you could leave, but we'll give you here, you know, debit cards and a good. We'll give you all the good stuff here, so that they should be in, have incentives to stay. Because quite frankly, they want them to be in Democrat states and cities, so that what, when they count the census, that these people will be counted in it, and so that the states that are Democrat run and have all these migrants that go there because right. more they people. get all the free stuff in Democrat more states. More people, more money. Right? Then, then in the election, it, it affects the election and the, the states get more delegates. And that's way they that way they can uh, illegally interfere in future elections. So it's a disaster. It's affecting the city. You have, you know, small business uh, shops that are going to be affected by this as well because you have many migrants that are opening on the street uh, with tables they're selling stuff and this is you have hundreds of, of these migrants doing it uh, in the city it's going to affect small businesses uh, they're not they're not going to be able to compete you know these these small businesses in, in New York City they're paying rent that could be through the roof whereas these people are out on the street selling clothing shoes mm-hmm. you know little stuff and they pay no rent. They pay absolutely nothing. They just have right. a couple of tables. Yeah, they're getting six months free and complaining about it in Denver. Small shops as well. Yep. And with, meanwhile, we have this sick, despicable buffoon in the White House that's talking about, we're going to have a bloodbath. We, we have a bloodbath now at the southern border. Mm-hmm. And wars across the world, thanks to the weakness of this Biden administration. And now we have a situation that could escalate beyond what anybody wants to think about. I mean, this could have ramifications for the entire world and we this better de escalate right away. Uh with uh you know, Israel now attacking Iran because Iran attacked them from their own territory for the first time. Why did that happen? The first time that Iran attacked Israel from their own territory, it's because Joe Biden emboldened Iran. He made them rich by waving away many of the sanctions that Trump put in place. And so they made billions of dollars selling oil to China and right. to Russia. And now they feel comfortable getting into a war that they 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 knew it's a risk that if they send from their territory missiles to israel that they're going to end up in a war with israel but they're comfortable with doing that and we're possibly facing a world war three bloodbath uh thanks to this horrible joe biden that's just going to talk about trump is so horrible instead of talking about the policies of his that were so disastrous from the border to the economy to portraying weakness on the world yeah. stage. And so many people miss all of that crazy right now, right? What, what I would do for a mean what? tweet and uh, $6,500 in annual uh, household income increased, right? And the question is, is the framing of Trump as being a criminal really going to convince Democrats? Because because Democratic voters are also fed up with the policies of Joe Biden. And so just some mean tweets weren't going to convince them because they don't like Trump's personality to vote against him. So that's why this uh, DNC was trying to turn him into a criminal with these trials. But the question is, how how much can he convince Democrats to say, oh, don't vote against President Trump because he's a criminal. We're framing right. him as a criminal. You have to you have to weigh the scale. And it seems like Trump's uh, winning. Uh, folks, I appreciate the call, Alex. We're going to continue with your calls and more straight ahead. 833-4-VALDEZ, 833-482-5337. Don't go anywhere. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833 833- 482 5337 833 4 Valdez. That's Valdez with an S. What this WHO international treaty that's uh, currently being ironed out over at the UN, what, what is it all about? Well, the key points are that with the support of the financial institutions of the Rockefeller Foundation, the Wellcome Trust, and the Gates Foundation, We're essentially ceding the ability to suspend all civil liberties and all of the rights associated with what we would call the Bill of Rights here in the United States, International Declaration of Human Rights. All of those can be suspended by a capricious determination that there's a public health emergency. And the minute that happens, there are no rights. In a nutshell, that's what the treaty is. And like the PREP Act was after the anthrax outbreak of 2001, which the U.S. perpetrated on the U.S. so that we could get to the PREP Act of 2005, the exact same playbook is how we got COVID to get us to this moment, which is to say 
terrorize the world, convince them that we need some giant protector state that actually has some sort of supranational ability, and then suspend civil liberties as long as they need to be suspended. And in this particular case, at the whim of funding agencies who have no criminal accountability. So in a nutshell, if you feel good about that, feel good about May. <laughs> well, that's the, um, the date, right? The date that this is supposed to go into effect is uh, May of this year. Uh, last year, a lot of people um, in the House of Representatives and the Senate were up in arms about this stuff. And one of them was um, U.S. Senator Jim Risch from Idaho. He, um, he wrote that the World Health Organization's track record over the last three years is nothing short of abysmal. And when the Chinese government lied to the world uh, for the first uh, months of the COVID-19 pandemic, the WHO basically parroted and praised China's officials. So when it came clear that China was covering up the truth about the deadliest health emergency in our century, the World Health Organization did nothing to hold it accountable. Uh, the WHO has failed in its core mission to protect global health time and again. And uh, most Americans know this. The American people uh, should be skeptical of any action that the World Health Organization takes to attempt to grow their own power and their own influence. And, of course, any international body that wants to dictate our laws, especially one whose missteps have been as blatant and deadly as the World Health Organization's, rightfully deserves criticism and pushback. Yet the Biden administration appears poised to sign a pandemic accord that would cede American sovereignty to the World Health Organization without the Senate's advice and consent. This would allow the WHO to create laws for all Americans without giving anyone from any state the opportunity to deliberately or even uh, vote on any of these changes. And... Um, Senator Risch uh, vows that he would not let that happen. It's the Senate's constitutional duty to review and approve such a treaty, but the president is uh, proceeding as though a legally binding pandemic treaty will not require Senate approval. It's a huge mistake. In its current form, the agreement would have major implications for the United States and could massively increase uh, the responsibility that the country has abroad. So one example is that some countries are aggressively pursuing language that would waive intellectual property protections for public health products. Um, IP protections are foundational in the United States, and they're the reason for millions of life-saving medical breakthroughs. American innovation is the reason that we have not one, but three effective COVID-19 vaccines. The push to waive this uh, intellectual property protection would slow down and could even prevent uh, the game-changing cures that are currently being developed in the first place. So he goes on and on, and it's, it's a really good letter. Uh, another serious issue that he points out is the current World Health Organization draft that relates to so-called uh, common but differentiated responsibilities for each country based on their GDP. As COVID-19 made uh, everything so clear, Pathogens don't really respect boundaries. So regardless of wealth, every country had a responsibility to uh, contain and respond to a virus, yet the World Health Organization is considering a provision that would allow countries to be a certain income threshold and to ignore that responsibility. While unethical and wrong, we should hardly be surprised at what they do at the WHO. After all, the WHO failed to hold China accountable for hiding the truth about COVID-19 from the world as it was happening. So a lot of people upset, and uh, I think I agree with that. I think there's um, still some commentary that we'll get to on that, but ultimately this is a, a bad idea, I think, and uh, I want to get your thoughts on it. Let's see. Where do we go? Um, let's go to Boise, Idaho, and check in with Paul, KBOI. Go right ahead. Thanks for taking my call. Yeah, that's pretty disturbing. That sounds like police state on steroids. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I just got a, a request for the people that are listening in. Pray for the real 
legitimate President Trump. He's under a lot of stress. You can see it on his face. And I just, I'm worried about the guy. He's he's being kept away from a golf course, and he loves it. And that's what where he gets his exercise, and he's locked in that chair listening to these people just shoot barbs at him. And I just, I feel sorry for the guy, and, and I miss him. If there's one night so far this year that I feel comfortable with him being the uh, commander in chief tonight would be the night with the, what's going on in Israel and Iran. And uh, the guy that's supposed to be in charge, he's, he's, he's asleep. Asleep at the wheel, Paul. I think you're right. And I think a lot of Americans miss president Trump being in charge of what's happening. And I agree with you. Uh, you know, they're putting him through the ringer. I'm glad he's taking a nap in court. Cause you gotta, you gotta take a nap. Right. Uh, even me. Right. You know, I feel a, a little uh, worn out today. I'm fighting a, a chest cold. And uh, and I just think of how, how difficult that presents for me. Just imagine somebody who's on the campaign trail in a different uh, place all the time, flying back and forth on his plane. Uh, I'm with you. It can't be easy and um, definitely requires a high degree of grace. Uh, so, Paul, thank you for your call. I appreciate it. And um, speaking of health, we got to keep ourselves healthy and make sure that we don't relinquish our rights to any type of World Health Organization um, mandate. I mean, that's for sure. Anyway, uh, keep it locked right here. We're going to come back to your calls and more. 833-482-5337-833-4 Valdez. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. Rich Valdez. Call now. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. If tomorrow the order goes out from the president, I'm the president of the United States, I issue an order. End the war today. Begin to withdraw all American troops. It will take a year to get the American troops out. Do you hear me now? That's the truth. It will take a year to get them physically out. Now, if you leave all the equipment behind, you might be able to do it in seven months. And you leave those billions of dollars of weapons behind, I promise they're going to be used against your grandchild and mine someday. That is Senator Joe Biden back in 1996 when he was running for president. And isn't it interesting uh, how he was referring to getting military equipment out of a country. You would have thought that that was an AI deep fake, but nope, archival footage, file footage of Joe El Baboso Biden saying exactly what many Republicans are criticizing him for. This disastrous, precipitous withdrawal from Iraq that didn't consider all of the conditions. And uh, today we have just a, a, a world of hurt there, a world of hurt. And he doesn't care. He doesn't care. He thinks he did the right thing. Meanwhile, you know, I don't know, that's probably 30 years ago. He, um, he's happy. He's happy to, uh, to say, look, no, we can't do that, to do the right thing. It fascinates me how, how compromised he's become, how many of his, position, his positions have changed. It's just such a shame. Anyway, we get to your calls. Let's go to Jim, Chicago, Illinois. Um... You have a, um, let's see, WGN, excuse me. Go right ahead, Jim. Hey, Rich. Thank you. Um, My pleasure. There's a photo, there's a, there's a photo by the Associated Press that was out on Tuesday, and it's of the Iraq Prime Minister Sudani meeting with Joe Biden in the Oval Office. They're both sitting. This was on Monday, this past Monday. And oddly, there's, a, uh, there's paintings behind them. 
And one painting above uh, Sudani is a painting of President Lincoln. And the odd thing is that it looks crooked. So that's kind of kooky. And I mentioned this to a couple of friends, and they mentioned something about a scope on a naval rifle of a photo that was backwards. So that's an odd thing. The other thing I want to I don't to know anything was, about that. What does this mean? Um, how, how did they get this information about the scope of the naval rifle? Uh, it's on it's on online. It's a uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, I guess a promotion for the for the navy. Oh, and I see. It shows us, and the scope is on backwards. Hmm. Yeah, I, I haven't, which is kooky. And I'm like, you know, America is about visual, so it's all about like you know how you present something. But the odd thing sure. was that painting, um, and it just looked like you know it looked like there's. You know, you hear it on the news how things are just like discombobulated with the yeah, Democrats. Yeah, things are off, and they're literally off in the Oval Office. <laughs> I get it. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate it. A great call. Uh, shout out to WGN Chicago, Illinois. And uh, Biden needs to get his act together and straighten himself out, literally and figuratively, because this isn't going to get any better for us. Let's go to Coleman, Alabama. WGN. Check in with our buddy Ron. Ron, go right ahead. You're on with Rich Valdez. Welcome. Yes, sir. Rock and Rich is Midnight Ramblers. <laughs> Thank you, you sir. Said you said gonna, you going to start that when you get retired, you know. Gonna be yeah, I love rock. it. Well, uh, I thought that might be a good name. But anyways, I, I'm troubled about uh, Bill Gates came out and trying to bring attention to our 1,100 American soldiers in uh, Nigeria, Africa. Mm-hmm. That's going to be stranded there now. And because Biden and Blinken refuse to allow them to leave after they've trained to, to, uh, the, and overtook the uh, Nigeria command, the commander there. Yeah, I'm not very familiar with the conflict that's going on, but because there's several um, throughout Africa, but it it doesn't surprise me, if based on the clip that we just heard, that Joe Biden uh, is messing things up. I mean, even guys like Obama and the rest of the crew that was in the uh, Situation Room when they got Bin Laden, all of them had a cr- uh, critique of Joe Biden that he just wasn't a foreign policy person. He was very weak on foreign policy. And, um, and and that's just a fact. And I think it's evident when we look at what's going on, we see it. We see exactly where uh, where Biden stands on a lot of this. And I, I, it's a shame. It's a shame we are where we are. Uh, folks, we're coming right back. Ron in Coleman, Alabama, WGN. I will um, thank you again, and I will likely use that name, Rockin' Rich, uh, Midnight. I love that. Uh, we're going to continue with your calls and more straight ahead. 833-4825-337. 833-4-VALDEZ. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833 valdez That's Valdez with an S. is America. This is night. This is Rich Valdez. All right, amigos, welcome back. We continue with our conversation. Open phone America, 833-482-5337. And let's go to Sarasota, Florida, W-E-N-G, and check in with Gia. Gia, you're on with Rich Valdez. Welcome. Thank you so much, Rich, for taking my call. I I hope you feel better soon. Thank hey, you. I appreciate I my comment. Oh, I appreciate you. Before I give my comment, I want to tell you the best moment of your show last year. Look at the deep state acting up. The best moment of my show last year, and the call cuts out. Gia, do we still have you? Now, let's put Gia on hold. Maybe she's in a bad spot, and we'll bring her back. Um, oh, is she there? Let's see. Let's try one more time. Yeah. 
Okay, okay go ahead. Me Best now? moment of the show. Yeah, when that crazy liberal guy called in, remember, and he was complaining about the piano music between the uh, segments, yeah. saying it sounded like a, a childish fiat. Remember that? that was yeah, hilarious. I do remember that. Unbelievable. <laughs> you know I'm a regular listener. Anyway. Oh, thank you. My comment, yeah, oh, yeah, almost every night. So Amen. my comment is, uh, I'm a courier. I do DoorDash and Uber Eats. That's why I'm out here every night. I got you on the radio, and I'm listening. So... Um, this free plane ticket thing, I know it's true because our Sheriff uh, Grady Judd and the I love Sheriff Texas, Grady Judd. Yeah, he had a uh, you know how he reports these busts that he does about three, four weeks ago. He had a big uh, human trafficking bust over there in Polk County. Yeah, and it was uh, and he was talking about this on YouTube how these people were from New York and they get free airline tickets they told him to anywhere they want to go and they were all illegal every one of them Mm. that's when i first heard about that so i knew it was true the other thing is you know i'm i'm an older lady i don't sound old but i'm old i'm almost i'm 66 years old but anyway Ah, spring chicken i'm I'm, I'm out here doing this uber eats and doordash every night and doordash has got a huge influx of of illegals that barely speak english that they're hiring. And, and they're I doing it on bicycle? Them, you know, no, they give them these almost brand new cars, almost every one of them. I'm like, wow. you've been here four months and you have a three-year-old car. How? You wow. know, and they're not. Yeah, I'll tell you like, this. Um, make sure you stay safe and make sure you're, you, you've you got, you know, an extra magazine if you have a semi-automatic or, you know, a quick load for your revolver if you're carrying a revolver. And make sure you're carrying something uh, and and some mace while you're at it. Because things can get hairy, and uh, you don't want to get caught in a jam. Uh, I appreciate your kind words. Thank you for the call. Big shout out to W E N G Sarasota, Florida. And uh, little spoiler: yes, I am fighting a chest cold. Uh, but B, I may not move to South Florida and actually go in that neck of the woods. I like Clearwater Beach, and um, I'm looking at stuff around there too. So we'll see how life ends up in the next year or two. Thank you, Gia. I appreciate you. God bless you. Let's continue with Michael Pendleton, Oregon, listening on KUMA. Michael, with about a minute and a half to go, go right ahead. Yes, Rich. Hey, great to talk to you and our fellow Americans. Uh, I, uh, Likewise. I want to say I'm very concerned, of course, about uh, the situation with Israel and Iran, uh, with uh, and, of course, with President Trump and his trials uh, there uh, in our prayers. Um, I wanted to mention I have several friends with relatives in the military. Do you see any of the current conflicts progressing to where we'll find American troops in any of those places? Only in NATO places should a a serious conflict occur, but uh, I doubt it. I don't think that's going to happen. That would be a really, really big deal. And uh, I think we have some that have been on the ground and, you know, in advisory capacities, in um, technical assistance capacities. Uh, but the minute we actually put American troops on the ground and in Ukraine or anywhere in Europe, um, outside of any involvement we have with NATO, is going to be a really big deal and opens the door for things that could be even worse. Michael in Pendleton, Oregon, KUMA, thank you for the call, my friend. And all of America, thanks for putting up with me and my chest cold. We made it through all three hours. Thank you. Godspeed to all of you. Hasta la próxima. Take care. Good night. And God bless you, America. God willing, I'll be back tomorrow.